So let's welcome with a huge round of applause the very beautiful, the very strong actress and philanthropist Lisa Ray and our dynamic chairperson Miss Minal Jain. Lisa has acted in films like Virapan, Kasoor and Water. She's an inspiration to many. A huge round of applause, Jaipur. Thank you all for the inaugural event of our new tenure. We are honored to have with us Lisa Ray, our guest speaker, an internationally acclaimed performer, philanthropist and a star with an interpretation of taking challenging issue-oriented films. Accidental actress, covert social activist, top model acclaimed celebrity, award-winning actress who starred in Canada's Oscar-winning nominated film, Water, amongst other prestigious credits. Named one of the most, 10 most beautiful Indian women in the millennium by Times of India poll, she hosts one of Canada's most highly talented rated television shows has, and has chronicled a public diagnosis of my, multiple my, myeloma, opened her own yoga studio, and recently launched her own line of social conscious fragments called Lisa Ray, Jasmine of India. And the list goes on. Lisa, your presence is our privilege. Thank you for being here today. I also welcome our national past president, Ms. Nita Bhujra, past president Flo, past chairpersons, members and board, members of the board and a dynamic executive committee. Our motto for the year, which is unlimited you, projects in front of us, for the next two months, a vision where all of us will make a serious endeavor to realize our hidden potentials our, and energies, overcome our mind blocks, and at the same time enjoy each and every moment of this interesting journey to self-discovery. The coming days and months will see us involved collectively and throw ourselves into streams of knowledge and wisdom, coming from a variety of events and sessions with talented artists, managers, life coaches, etc. Let's all keep a sincere intent to interconnect and network with the, within this huge ocean of intellectual and talented assets of our members and see for ourselves miracles of gradual transformations to our positive surroundings and people being another journey of self-development through this dynamic platform called Fiki Flow, Fiki Ladies Organization. To be enabled to harness the available pool of experience and depth of knowledge of our senior members and mentors who will surely benefit and enable to confidently indulge in complex decisions in our lives and businesses. Let's all prepare ourselves for real takeaways from a series of events and workshops planned in the coming months to be conducted by professionals, business leaders of national and international repute. Friends, I would like to share with you one of Flo's National Health Initiative Cancer Cervical Awareness Program. One woman dies of cervical cancers every seven minutes, in spite of that it being totally curable. We at Flo intend to spread awareness through various means at our disposal. Friends, I'm glad to share with you that our chapter has also pioneered to launch today for the first time UID cards for our members, first among all Pan-India chapters. Congratulations to all of us. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. I am, uh, well, first of all, thank you. I'm filled with gratitude looking at this room of of wonderful people who have gathered here today. And I feel very humbled that you've come here just to hear me tell my own personal story. And, and I was actually very excited when uh, Minal approached me, particularly, first of all, what a lovely lady and very persistent. And thank you very much for putting this all together. It's, as I said, uh, you know, a great platform, I think. Uh, and I am a very, very big believer in sharing and the power of support and community. So we're gathered here today to talk a little bit about how do you live before you die? And it sounds like a very bit of a morbid statement, you know, particularly because I think there's a great charge around the word death for a lot of people. Death, you know, depending on which filter you look at it, is, has such a finality about it. And it's also tinged with so much mystery. It's the greatest mystery of our life, and at the same time, it's the only 
truth of our life. It's the only one event of our life that we know will happen. Everything else is open to potential, is open to change. But death will touch all of us at some point. So I wanted to share my personal story of how through touching my own mortality and through a combination of circumstances, I come to a place where I believe that I am living much more fully in this, what I call Lisa 2.0 version than ever before. And uh, maybe a lot of you don't know this about me, but I'm actually a covert writer. At this phase of my life, actually, I'm working on a book and I have been doing a lot of writing. So if you'll indulge me, I'm going to read this piece that I wrote, which will maybe put into context my life before we start maybe talking about death a little bit. I recently came across the Japanese tradition of kintu kusuroi, which is the art of repairing broken pottery with gold lacquer and understanding that the piece is more beautiful for having been broken. Often we expect repairs to be seamless and to make the object appear to be new again. Whereas this art pays homage to the idea that there is a place for better than new or better than perfect. Not merely observing your cracks, but decorating them with gold is a philosophy which would serve us well in this world. I was born to be a nomad. As a young girl growing up in Toronto, I celebrated both Christmas and Durga Puja, but never felt fully at home in Canada. Childhood was a series of idyllic moments spent in a middle-class suburban utopia full of bike rides and swimming lessons and other pursuits, but my eyes were always focused on the horizon and my mind floated into a dreamscape which captured my attention more than immediate events around me. My Bengali father passed on his love of the arts and philosophy while my Polish mother left, kept our home running smoothly. And I learned to balance somewhere between these two points. In me, there was a converging of not just two different cultures and bloodlines, but two varying approaches to life the pragmatic and the poetic. This rich and multi-layered identity actually proved problematic when I was growing up. In the late 70s and 80s, in the pre-globalized world, there were very few other people of mixed ethnicities and identities that I could identify with. On top of that, India was the only place in the world where I felt totally at home. Be careful what you wish for. I was first approached to model on a trip to Bombay with my mom and dad. I was all of 16 and had graduated from high school a year early in order to see more of the world. As so happens, I found myself in photographer Ashok Salian's studio, fluidly moving from pose to pose like I was born for the camera and appearing a full decade older while I was doing it. So here suddenly was a space where I could shed my introverted behavior and create a new persona free of confusion and angst. It was creative and freeing and playful, and I didn't take it seriously. This was the early 90s, remember, when modeling and acting were really not a legitimate career option, particularly for an academic half-bungla girl with an eye on a career in journalism or the law. So I returned to Canada to begin university when fate dealt its hand. On a clear, crisp day in late August, we were driving home from a picnic in the country when my father swerved to avoid a car and lost control. Our Honda Civic rolled and came to a rest in the grass beside a golf course. I was removed from the car by an emergency crew. I knew nothing in life would ever be the same again. My mother and I had switched our seats that afternoon. And because of that, she was thrown from the back of the car and seriously damaged her spine. She would never walk again. I can still feel liquid grief pulse through my veins even as I write this. My mother was my lifeline, the custodian of our comfort and raw, earthy wisdom. There was no deeper trauma than losing your mother twice, as I did. 
once to this horrifying spinal cord injury, then many years later, letting her go beyond her physical discomfort. My mom passed in 2008, just a few months before my own diagnosis of cancer. They say that you can only understand life by glancing in the rearview mirror. And so I've come to recognize that every major turning point in my life has actually been preceded by pain or difficult events. It's been a strong and important lesson in reframing experiences with an openness to what they teach rather than wallowing in the challenges or the pain that they produce. But listen, that did not happen overnight. It took many years in the beginning. And in the beginning, pain was simply that, pain, a deep, dark throb in the center of my being. So, basically, my career in India and entertainment started on the edge of a sword. On one side was instant fame and fortune, and on the other side, great personal grief and pain. And actually, it's because of this that I came to understand very early on in life that fame and even money often cannot not offer a lot of personal comfort. So after that, I began my decade of making memories in Mumbai. I'm sure a few of you might remember some of my earliest campaigns, if you were around then, Bombay Dying, Glad Rags, the uh, Garden Campaign, Afreen Afreen. Wow, that was a long time ago. But I'm greatly gratified that people actually still remember those campaigns. Since the accident, I, find it, I started to find my voice and to heal, and gradually, something started shifting inside me. In opening to each and every experience fully, both painful and pleasurable, I was discovering a way not just to merely survive my youth, but to thrive even in the darkest experience. They say that the way of an artist is to be able to transform every experience. And so I began to live my life as if it were a giant canvas. As I got more and more in touch with a deeper essence, I became more immune also to outside criticism and all the voices and more fearless of the challenges and more in touch with the everyday magic and mystery of living beyond the image and beyond the mundane. And while, truthfully, truthfully I was offered the most lucrative Bollywood projects of the era, I actually refused them all until a little film called Kasur. And I was working with Vikram Bhatt, who was a director who had a very similar sensibility with me and a sensitivity towards actors. And he also opened my perspective on how acting could not just be a profession or a way to make money, but actually a personal mission to understand myself and human nature and to bring great stories to an audience. So I felt very hooked by that experience, but I also felt very personally trapped by this image that had been imposed on me by the media and by my career in India. So life called me and I listened. I ended up leaving India and I crossed the ocean in search of my voice and to grow my personal power. I spent time in London, Paris, Milan, and New York, and it was an opportunity to find myself away from the image that I had become trapped by in India. Although I've always had a very special connection with India, and I missed it, and I would keep coming back, but I would not make any public appearances. So while I was living in, 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 and working in Europe, and I went to drama school, I studied mime, believe it or not, and poetry. I started a successful career in indie films, culminating with a film, with an Oscar-nominated film, Water, which put me on the map at that time internationally. I realized that what bothered me most about the glamour industry was what I call the pathology of perfection. So as a student of drama, what I was attracted to was human behavior in all of his colors and imperfections. I mean, we're funny buggers, aren't we? If we have to be truthful about it. We are, we're a package. And we're a wonderful package, but we're a beautifully messy package as well. And the more that we try to impose this false image of perfection and politeness, the further we move, I think, from our true essence and our truth, which is the fact that we're human beings. 
We are simply human beings and we are a bundle of so many complex things and we should celebrate that complexity. Now today in the age of the internet and globalization, this meant that kids have access to information and they are also still very vulnerable to media messaging of this kind of image of femininity and these unreal red carpet images which, by the way, let me make it clear, take a full four hours of hair, makeup, and styling to achieve. That's what people don't see. So, honestly, even today, it took me a good, what did I tell you, Mino? Yes. Two hours. By the way, I didn't roll out of bed looking like this, as Mino can attest to. She saw me at the airport in all my unmade-up glory. Um, so, my point is that we have to... So... The next phase of my life was I was flying high after Waters' Oscar nomination and I was commuting between Los Angeles and Paris and being courted by uh, Hollywood studios and shooting in South Africa and feeling, you know, rather chuffed about the life I had created. Of course, I was also world class in ignoring my body's messages and signals. I'd get extremely fatigued in the afternoon. So I changed my diet, you know, I drank more coffee or I ate less rice and I did everything except go to a doctor to get myself checked. So my body was communicating with me, but I was not picking up the phone. I was pressing, do not answer. Now, finally, after a yoga retreat, and I was actually taking a yoga teacher training course in Kerala, I really hit a wall. After one class, I stayed on the floor in Shavasana, which of course everyone knows is literally corpse pose, for an entire hour because I wasn't able to get off the floor. I was that fatigued. Finally, I could not ignore it and I knew something was desperately wrong. And I couldn't live in denial anymore. So, a few months later, I sat in a hematologist's office and in Toronto and he very nervously was pronouncing my diagnosis. He said, you have multiple myeloma. Silence. Gulp. I still remember. I said, would you like some water, doc? Because he looked so traumatized. And he kept pausing meaningfully, waiting for me to burst into tears while I was taking on this information. Now, first of all, I had no clue what the hell multiple myeloma was. I go in a little bit more into detail on my cancer journey because that really is the reason why I feel I'm living fully today. I actually owe a great debt of gratitude to cancer. And I don't recommend this for anybody else, but this has been my own personal journey. So basically, when I announced my diagnosis, this terrifying diagnosis from the red carpet at the Toronto International Film Festival. I had put on 40 pounds from steroids and had developed the classic moon face. Like literally, I had this hump on my back and this huge moon face. But here is the amazing thing. I actually felt more at ease than ever before in my life in my body and my soul. I was actually free of this pathology of perfection. And by hijacking this very public moment on the red carpet, on this terrifying red carpet, I was actually finally talking about something that was much more meaningful to me personally than just promoting another project, another film, another product, another, you know, etc., etc., etc. This was very important to me. It was something that was personally meaningful to me and to all of humanity. I was talking about life. I was standing there 40 pounds overweight and I was celebrating life and the spirit that we have to survive. Now my question is, what do you care about? What matters? Well, it's very simple then. Pursue that and forget the rest. It's been the simplest lesson of my life. Thank you.
Thank you so much. It really has. I mean, I really feel that often we are the source of complicating or overcomplicating sometimes our life. In a sense, cancer has freed me. Therefore, I wear my Portacath scar. I have a scar. Okay, don't get excited here. This is, I still wear it very proudly. I actually have a device called a, it's a catheter, which is still used, which was uh, implanted into me to, for my treatment during cancer. I still use it for my blood tests. And in fact, often when I do events and things like that, you know, sometimes makeup artists say, hey, do you want to cover that up? I'm like, don't you touch it. If anything, let's draw a big red ring about it and maybe an arrow. <laughs> I wear it with pride, you know, as I do all the scars that, you know, that are part of my own personal journey, part of my experience that have made me the person that I am today. And as I said, going back to this question, how to live before you die. I wanted to share one really important experience I had. Uh, and as I, you know, as maybe you, now you've gotten a taste, we all have our personal stories and journeys. I've experienced great highs and great lows in life. And often, ironically, what I found, I, I once gave a talk where they requested me to sort of draw out a graph or a chart. And I said, plot your highs and your lows on this chart. And what I realized is that often in my life when I was younger, when I was experiencing great, personal, uh, great professional success, I was also at exactly the same time experiencing great personal difficulties, you know? So how do you define success then, is my question. Is it just something for the outer world? Is it fair enough to say, well, I'm being celebrated right now when your heart is breaking, when your mother's lying in the hospital, when you're feeling broken inside, when you just need to heal, to be quiet, to be still, when you just need understanding from the world and not the world necessarily to celebrate you or want to put you on a platform. Is that actually success? So one wonderful sort of side effect of having gone through these experiences at such a young age, and I started working when I was 16, as, as I mentioned, is that it helped me see through the illusion and it helped me go through the process which I would advise everyone in this room and everyone where everyone I come across is to redefine success for yourself. We get a lot of pressure. Thank you, I feel very strongly about this. And this is part of, again, being able to live fully. You know, society is complex. Society obviously, in any society and culture. And again, I want to reaffirm that I love India. And, you know, I consider myself a very proud Indian, you know, at the end of the day, I celebrate Indian culture. But not without discriminating, in the sense that my sense of discrimination is I don't just accept what people say is the right thing to do or the standards or you must do this, this is what your life should look like, this is how, this, you should be this age, you should marry by this age, you should have kids by this age, you should do this, you should do that, you should wear these clothes, you should not wear these clothes. I mean, there's a lot of rules that are thrown by us. There's a lot of don'ts and do's and should and, you know, and my point is, without questioning, if you just accept without questioning, how are you going to develop your own inner compass, your own inner sense of truth, and then take responsibility for your life? And design your life, design the kind of life that you want. That's the greatest secret of life. But it starts with redefining success for yourself. And that takes some personal reflection. It's not the easiest thing to do. The easiest thing to do is to follow all the rules. Although, to be honest, that also can create a great deal of pain as well. Because it gets confusing. And you may not be living your truth. I mean, if you are living your truth and you feel comfortable with that, it's fantastic. But I know when I really get down to having very truthful conversations, I think all of us human beings, it might be human nature to feel restless, to feel a little sense. You get to a certain point in your life and no matter what you've experienced, and frankly, often it's the most successful peer, as people that experience this. Okay, I've experienced this, this, this. 
Now what? Why do I still feel that something is missing? So my mom had passed. I'm very close to my father. We ended up taking my mother's ashes, even though my mother, as I said, was Polish. She was more of a Punjabi mother, believe me. She was very, really, she was, she had all the characteristics of a Punjabi mother. And um, she loved India. She spent a lot of time here when I was living here. So we scattered half of her ashes in, uh, in Toronto and we took uh, the rest of her ashes to India. And we went down to Kanyakumari. And then I wanted to take my father to Dharamshala because I had experienced a great personal transformation at a 10-day silent meditation retreat there. And I actually really recommend silence as a practice for everyone at some point. It's not easy. I know a lot of friends who are like silent for 10 days. I can be silent for two minutes. Do you? I'm sure we all know people like that. But it's very cleansing. But anyways, I had experienced something incredible. And I really felt that the Buddhist perspective on living and dying would also help my father. Now, I was very worried about my father. My mother and my father were each other's great loves. They had gotten married against their family's wishes. They had fought society. Because we're talking about the 1960s for a good Bengali Brahmin to go against his father's wishes and marry this blonde, blue-eyed white woman was quite scandalous in those days. But the whole family came around. They had this wonderful relationship. I was worried about my father. So I took him to this place called Tushita, where, as I said, they run this Buddhist retreat. And so I checked in my father 10 days. And I had, because I had experience with meditation, I just decided I'm here for 10 days. I may as well see what other course is running at the same time. I'll take it. Turned out to be a course on death and dying. Really uplifting, right? Really fun, like, woo, Friday night. Um, but I decided to take it. And it turned out to be not just prophetic, because I was diagnosed with cancer six months after that, but also set me up for this experience in a very, very strange way. And it was also one of the most joyful things I've ever done in my life. It's, my question is, why don't we do the same about death? Why do we just brush it aside? It is an uncomfortable topic. I'm not denying that. But we must actually sit with these things. And I thought that their philosophy has served me very well because ironically, as I said, after rehearsing this, after thinking about it, after meditating about it, I was actually confronted with it six months down the line. And I really believe that a lot of what I did helped me not just confront, you know, my cancer journey, but has really helped me live with greater juice and passion and fearlessness even today. So thank you so much. I'm sure I've gone on and on because I, I speak from the cuff, you know, off the cuff and from the heart. But thank you for your patience and listening to me. and Ms. Meenal Jain to unveil the poster on cervical, aware, cervical cancer awareness program. Yes. Hi, Lisa, Richa. I saw you some 20 years back at Umed Bhavan. You were shooting for a song. Uh, some South movies. Oh looks my so God, I remember. I remember. Absolutely, you were, you were wearing this uh, blue dress and you were sh uh, shooting a song sequence. Yeah, and yes. And you looked gorgeous. You still look gorgeous. That's so sweet, Richa. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, uh, my mother-in-law is also a cancer survivor. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, she's not here. She just got operated for her eye. Okay. I would like to know how do you deal with the fear of living with the cancer and the, uh, the fear of getting it back? Because we have somebody in the house also with us, so. That, uh, that's a wonderful question. I'm, I'm glad you're asking me this. Um, and, and, and as I said, I, I am technically living with something every day. I'm still on medication every day. Um, I'll never be in the clear as it is. Um, I believe the fear never actually goes away. 
you know, fear, it really is one of those things. And it's almost like if you actually push it or struggle with it more, it'll come back at you. Um, for myself, meditation has helped because with simple meditation, you can actually watch your thoughts and become, at least create a little space so that you recognize that the thoughts don't have to have control over you all the time. Uh, but with me, with my cancer journey, there, were, there was a lot of ups and downs and I dealt with my cancer by writing about it. So as I said, I wrote my blog, um, Humor. Um, you know, I mean, I started writing a blog not for anyone else, but to help me understand, to sort through my thoughts. Because to be honest, here's, here's the tricky thing about cancer, is that as much as your family, your friends want to help you, nobody else can understand what you're going through, except perhaps another cancer survivor. And the tendency is, you know, sometimes we want to isolate ourselves. It's such a difficult time. You feel like you have less energy. People are asking you sometimes invasive questions, you know, and you feel like, just leave me alone. So, you know, I went through that, which is why I started writing. It helped me to under, you know, process my thoughts. And it just so happened I turned into a blog. And the act for me of sharing, and believe me, a lot of people advise me not to be open about my cancer and share, was cathartic for me. Because the other thing, you know, the other interesting thing about life is if you don't ask for help, how are you gonna get it? So I managed to get so much support from India. India gave me so much support when I went public with my cancer diagnosis and I had support from all over the world, um, aside from my inner circle, I think that that really helped me emotionally. You know, they say that another way of looking at cancer, and fortunately what's happening in cancer also from a medical perspective, is they're starting to uh, change their perspective from just like we have to use chemo and kill the bad cells but also kill the good cells, to let's boost the immune system. Let's work, you know, there's a new field and I would encourage you maybe also to research it because we have to take responsibility as well, you know, for our healing and, you know, at, the whole family gets involved, I understand that. So immunotherapy, immunology is the new frontier in treating cancer where instead of using chemo, it's about boosting your immune system. And there's a lot of very promising things happening and it makes sense, right? So in the same way, instead of feeding the fear, Boost the happiness quotient. Boost the joy. Boost the sense of security. Boost the humor. Or boost whatever that person needs. Every individual is going to be different. So what works for me, the reason sometimes I'm a little hesitant about giving advice to another cancer survivor, we're all different. Just because we have cancer, you don't also put us in one group and we're all like, ah, we're all cancer survivors. <laughs> so, you know, I, I mean, everyone is different. Just because you have cancer, we're, you're still going to have your own. So, you know, sometimes it might be good just to listen. Maybe sometimes you need to talk and offload. Just vent, talk about your fears, get them off your chest and not keep it inside. Maybe just going out and forgetting about it, seeing a film. So that's what I mean, boost the quotient the happiness quotient the antidote to fear is i think boosting the other things and just being there for that person thank you so much. Thank, you. thank you thank you next question next question uh, good evening lisa uh, uh, like everybody by now must have come to know that you have seen so many ups and downs in your life and I just wanted to know that what was the first thought, what was the first feel which came to your mind when you finally came to know? Because as you said that uh, cervical cancer uh, is technically incurable. Mm -hmm. So what was that first thought which came to your mind when you finally came to know that you are going to survive through it successfully? Thank you for your question. Um, you know, very honestly, I... I don't know, I'm, I'm also a weird bugger, right? Like I had my own particular reaction, which I've written about in my blog. And another reason why I'm glad that I wrote the blog is because I wrote it in the moment. So I really, I was very honest and frank and captured what I was feeling in that moment. Because who I am today, I may not be able to answer that as well. You know, memory is a tricky thing. But I wrote literally that same day. 
after getting diagnosed and then every day going through my treatment. So I can honestly say the funny thing is, I actually felt, I, it's almost like a belief or it was almost like a message that I got that it's okay, you're gonna survive. So I, basically what I wrote is it never occurred to me that I might die. Now I don't know if that's a function of being a, a very stubborn Aryan. I don't know if there's any Aries in the room. You will know what yes, I mean. Yes, I am. Yeah, so you, you will know what I mean. We're very stubborn people. I really know. <laughs> Uh, so I don't know if it was a function of being a stubborn Aryan um, or, you know, my own personal coping mechanism. But in my mind, I had created this space where it never occurred to me that I would die. Now, I did realize it was not going to be easy. And as I said, I Googled it and I saw all these frightening things. But you know what? I protected myself from that. I had my own coping mechanism and I realized I found a great doctor. I surrendered myself to that doctor. I said, doctor, doc, I know you, you're going to get me out of this. And I get, you know, I'm going to take personal responsibility for my life. I'm going to work with you. We're going to partner on this. I'm going to do everything you tell me to do. I'm going to take care of myself and I'm not going to die. So that has been my attitude throughout. Not to say that I don't have weak moments. Absolutely. That's the nature of being a human being, you know. Again, I'm, I'm perfectly imperfect, and I embrace that. But in a weird way, as I said, I think that a lot of my experiences in life led up to that moment, if that makes any sense, of being able to reframe this experience and not see it as something that is absolutely frightening the end of me. Um, but this is going to be a learning experience, and it's not going to be easy, but I will get through it. And as I said, at the end of it, you know, there was a lot of, so much encouragement from other people once I went, once I was public about my cancer experience, that that gave me a sense of purpose. I'm going to get through this so that I can speak to other cancer survivors, so that we can have a movement in India in particular and start speaking about it openly and, you know, help others understand it's not a taboo. Don't be afraid, you can get through it, you know don't feel like this is a death sentence. So maybe that was part of my own personal purpose in this life, I don't know. Next question. Yeah. Remy has a question. Yeah. Hi, Lisa. Hello. I just want to ask you, uh, how's your being spiritual or your, the tryst which you've uh, experienced in Dharamshala has made you to face cancer and makes a person immune to the cancers? Thank you, uh, thank you for asking. Um, <clears throat> I, you know, I shared a little bit of my story about, uh, you know, going on the meditation retreat and what that did for me. I, I, I you know, I don't want to get into a zone where I'm, you know, I don't think that there's any one cure. It's like, if I do this meditation, I will be cured or it will help me with this serious disease. For me, it's a combination of everything. It's taking responsible. And for me, living a full life or being healthy in life means doing everything. It means taking care of body and mind and spirit. They all have to work together. They all have to be harmonious. So if one is out of balance, then everything is out of balance. So I think obviously my, my uh, meditations helped me find balance, emotional balance in dealing with my disease and gives me perspective. Um, and as I said, I think more than anything, what I would like to share is don't wait. I think everyone, you shouldn't wait until you get this, you know, red flag or this horrible message that like, oh my God, now I'm dealing with a serious disease, now I'm gonna become spiritual. I mean, that doesn't work either, you know? I feel that to be a really good human being, to live a harmonious life, because today's world is so crazy and complicated. I mean, my God, you know, the amount of complexity that, is, that I've seen personally in the last 20, 25 years of my life is tenfold. I don't know how the kids today are doing it, to be honest. So I think if anything, to be a well-rounded human being, we need to switch off our devices and we need to switch on our inner light and look inside. Hi, I have a question. As an Can we take the last question of the evening? 
Yeah, and uh, one second. Can I just request all the ladies to please stay back for a while? We're just finishing the session soon. As an Afreen girl, you've been like wonderful. I remember your eyes till now. So how did you celebrate your success? Was it like a, like a, you know, you've been into a Bollywood world from a total different content of US. So was it very different or you felt same pace as you were in, you know, Canada or the US? No, as I said, I came to India when I was 16 and I was launched and I became an overnight success and sensation. And I'm more a Bombayite, I'm not a Canadian today. I have a Canadian passport, but I'm very much an Indian, I'm very much a Bombay girl. So, I, yeah, I, I saw a lot of success, but as I said, sure, I celebrate the success. And I'm very, I love my projects and I love to act and I still love, you know, uh, I still love getting photographed. I still love the fact that at 45 I can still model, my God. Today, if somebody calls me sexy, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> When I was, honestly, when I was younger, I would get a little offended. Yeah, but I have a brain too, <laughs> you know? So, you know, I'm, I'm a lot more relaxed with who I am today, you know? It's quite funny. So, and, and I'm actually more comfortable with myself and in my body. I have absolutely enjoyed my ride. I've enjoyed every single experience. And to be honest, all I ever wanted out of life was experiences. It wasn't a goal like I want to be this actress or I want this amount of money in my bank or nothing like that. For me, as I said, redefining success has been this amazing, you know, mosaic of experiences that I've had. Look at the amount of opportunity and experiences I've had, and I'm so grateful to India for that, that India accepted me wholeheartedly, and today I'm fully an Indian more than anything else. I mean, I'm a nomad, I'm very much a global citizen, but India has my heart and India has given me so much. So my greatest successes and celebrations have, have been in India, and I'm grateful for that. Lisa, I would say the other way around. India is proud to have a citizen like you. <laughs> so thank you, everyone. Thank you. And thanks, Lisa, for patiently answering all the questions. My pleasure. Can I now request our chairperson, Ms. Minal Jain, to present a memento to Ms. Lisa Ray? Thanks, Minil. I, Natasha Chaudhya, on behalf of Vicky Ladies Organization and the entire Flow Fraternity, extend a very hearty vote of thanks to our guest speaker, Ms. Lisa Ray. A big thank you to you, ma'am, for taking out time and gracing us on our inaugural session for the year 2017-18. Today, as we begin a new journey, we learned a new lesson of life. Life is not about compromise and complaints but it is about being happy and content. Ma'am, your talk was an eye-opener and thanks for giving us a new meaning of life. Your words will certainly make a difference in all our lives.